prepare for nerdgasm. Hey, what's up, Nerdgasm fans? Jerry here, a.k.a. Barnacles, with another video for you guys. Today I'm going to show you a little bit of development stuff that I did. Um, you guys have actually been asking me to, you know, kind of show you what I do. Um, this isn't exactly a great demonstration of it. It's just a project I wanted to do, but I wanted to follow up on these Belkin Wemo switches. These are those things I did uh, my last video on, and they're basically just Wi-Fi controlled devices. They connect to your Wi-Fi network, and if you have an iOS device, you can run a free app that you download, Belkin Wemo. And uh, it finds all the switches in your house that you give names when you set them up, and you can turn them on or off. And, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it. They also have sensors, too, but I'm not going to get into that because I don't have any of the sensors. But the on-off switches, um, they were given to me by my friend Greg, and you can go watch the other video to, to get some context on uh, the unboxing and the review and all that stuff. But for this, I wanted to write some software to control it. And the problem was Belkin doesn't have any kind of a library. And if you program a library, it's basically like a set of instructions that are abstracted or a simpler way to control a device. That way I don't have to send a bunch of ones and zeros to it. I can basically just get down to the nitty gritty and say I want to turn you on or turn you off. Well, Belkin didn't have any software like that. They're only supported on iOS right now. So I went to the Belkin forums, and there's a bunch of people asking for APIs and stuff. And it looks like Belkin might do it at some point, but they don't have it yet. So I decided to write my own. So after scouring the internet, sniffing network traffic, pulling packets apart, and all that stuff, which I won't try to go into too much detail because I don't want this video to be an hour long, um, I decided it was possible for me to write my own software to control the device. And that led to what am I going to use the device for? Well, I actually have a perfect use for this device. My cable modem, like so many other people, if you transmit a lot of connections or a lot of traffic or you got too much stuff going on at once, every once in a while they'll hang up on you. They just basically lock up. Uh, and you got to go do the whole spiel where you unplug the modem for 30 seconds, plug it back in, wait a minute, see, and then it gets an IP address and it goes again. And 9 out of 10 times it does. Even if it's hung for like a day or two, I come back from vacation, I unplug it, plug it in, boom, it gets an IP address. So my wife has to do that sometimes also when I'm at work. So I decided to automate that entire process. So I'm going to show you right now. I'm doing some screen capture, so we'll see how well this goes. You guys can let me know how I'm doing. But I have Visual Studio 2012 up and running here, and I just installed Windows 8. If you guys follow me on Facebook, you know that I just uh, corrupted a bunch of data on my hard drives trying to overclock the shit out of this beast machine, and uh, the SSDs didn't like that super high front side bus. So I went ahead and knocked her down a notch. We're running at like 4.7 now uh, on 3930K. So it's fast enough. Anyways, back on topic here. I created a project in Visual Studio called Wemo. It's basically a C-sharp.net 4.5 library. And technically, I didn't need to build it for 4.5. I just did because I was lazy. Could, this, this code would build fine on probably 4 or 3.5. Uh, but I created two things. I created a library, which is basically what I was talking about earlier, that abstraction layer that turns the ones and zeros into simple things like I want to turn you on and turn you off. And then I created an application called Wemo, which is right there, that uh, leverages that. And so the Wemo application itself is pretty simple. If you go through it, most of it, I don't. if you don't recognize C-sharp, just hang with me here. Some of this will make sense. Some of it won't. Um, and if you don't find it interesting, you can fast forward to the end and see the end result. But what I did with the Belkin Wemo class here is we had to figure out how to communicate with these devices. Well, these devices supposedly support UPnP, which is universal plug and play. It's a set of networking protocols that basically allow devices to discover each other and manipulate, manipulate each other over a network. And it's a pretty simple protocol. It's all based on these things called SOAP packets, which are basically just XML inside of XML. I mean, uh, you can get, I can get way more complicated than that, but let's just leave it simple for this video. Uh, what I need to do is figure out how, this, how the cell phone communicates with this device. So what I had to do was set up a bridge uh, on my laptop and capture network traffic. And even then, I wasn't able to capture everything I needed. I came close. Uh, but that coupled with some research and some forums, and we come up with this. And these two things right here, these are two strings that I define in my application. These are the most important things in the application. And honestly, both strings are exactly the same with respect to one byte, which is right here. Uh, where is it? There, the binary state, zero or one, which pretty much amounts to on or off for the device. So in a nutshell, what I have to do is I have to get this, what we'll call a payload, um, to the device so that it'll respond to the action. So these were the hard things to figure out right here. This I had to actually sniff network traffic and stuff to figure out. So now we need to figure out how to get it to the device. Well, the problem with this particular device is, is the UPnP standard. If you just say, hey, UPnP, you send out a broadcast packet on UDP protocol, and you say, hey, all devices that are UPnP, uh, announce yourself. 
Um, this device comes back and says, hey, hey, here I am. I'm a weakened Belmos uh, controller, which is like a switch. And you're like, awesome, I'm going to issue you a command. So you go ahead and issue it a command, and the whole UPnP stack blows up, And uh, at least in Windows. It, it doesn't actually in Linux. Some people wrote some Linux libraries that didn't have this problem using UPnP. So in a nutshell, because they didn't implement UPnP exactly perfectly, uh, the Microsoft UPnP DLL would not communicate with the device beyond just finding it. So I had to change things up a little bit. So what I do is I use UPnP to actually find the device. And uh, I don't do a lot of these code review videos, so we'll just bounce around a little bit here. And you can see this function. I have get devices that I created right here. And the get devices actually loads up the UPnP library. The UPnP library calls and says, okay, go get me everything basically that's a root device. This means the device that's at the top most of the chain. So you might have devices that have children. All I care about are the ones that are at the top of the food chain. So I'm saying go get me all those devices. And then I loop through those devices and I look for the ones that have a URN and I'm named Belkin. So I know that those are Belkin devices and I can manipulate them. Then as I find each one of those devices, I add them to a collection based on what they are. Are they a switch or are they a sensor? I don't support sensors, but I went ahead and put a class in here anyway so that I can add support for it later. So once it goes through and filters out all the UPnP devices that I don't need and only records the ones that it found that are the Belkin switches, uh, we go up here... And you can see this. I have a send command. Now, the send command is a part of the switch class. You can see that I created right here. And the sensor class is pretty much empty. It'll, it'll have more stuff in it later on. But all I did is I created this one abstract class here that derives from... Well, it's not abstract. Sorry. It's a Wemo switch that derives from Wemo device, which is the base level device. Everything that's a Wemo device can either be a switch or a sensor. So I started out with a basic device that shares all those functionalities. And then I basically abstracted from that based on its strong type. If you're a sensor, you can do this. If you're a switch, you can do that. Um, Object-oriented programming 101. Uh, so coming in here, I have the send command. And you can see, here's the problem that I ran into. is Normally send command, if I was using a UPnP library that was compatible with these devices, um, it would be as simple as me basically just sending an action. I would basically just send an action to these devices saying I want to invoke basic event here and I want to set the binary state to 1 or 0. Well, when I do that, it blew up. So instead, what I have to do is create this HTTP web request object, which sends an HTTP header request with a payload to, uh, to basically a web server. Normally is how it would be used. But what I do here is I basically abstract the presentation URL, which is a field from the object returned by UPnP, that contains basically a URL to the presentation you know, .xml file. Well, I don't want any of that, so I basically use that to parse out the base URL and the port to connect to the device. So now that I have that information, I then use HTTP request. I build this header. I have the SOAP action, which this was a big pain in the ass that cost me a couple hours. I was missing these two little escaped quotes right here. And it was seriously just causing the device to crap back at me. And I was like, what the hell? So that took a little while to figure out. But anyways, this is the packet that I created. It's a, it's, a, it's a post request that I'm sending to the device. And I'm sending an action of SOAP action. And this is the very specific magic sauce that tells it what I'm going to call. And then I come down here and I basically send one of these two strings, depending on what I want to do, turn the device on or turn the device off. And then once I commit that to the device, lo and behold, the device turns on, the device turns off. So that, that's, that's pretty much what this library does right here. And it's not a lot of code. You can see it's mostly with developing stuff like this. It's trolling around on forums and stuff, trying to figure shit out more than it is actually writing code. Okay, so now we go down to the Wemo program. This is the program that invokes the library and actually uses it. So... If you look here, I have a function, simple print usage function. It, on the command line, if you just run the tool, it basically tells you how to use it. And it takes three parameters. Uh, well, one of them's optional. But it takes a device and an action, basically. So you name the devices when you configure them. Like this one, for instance, is Wemo Espresso, because I'm going to use it to turn on my espresso machine in the morning. Uh, and so what you do is you pass it the device name, and then you pass it the action, whether you want to turn it on or off. And then there's an argument that you can pass called query, which basically just tells it to go out on the devices and find all the Belkin switches and give you the names. So that way, if you forget the name of one of your devices, you can just say, hey, go find every switch in the house, tell me the names, and then you can run the program again with one of those names and it'll work. So you can see in here, I got my shameless plug that I left in there. So anybody that finds this application and uses it can come find the YouTube channel. And uh, this is all just pretty generic stuff to check arguments, make sure you're passing in the right arguments, make sure the data you're passing is valid. Um, this is all just command line validation stuff. Well, once you get past all that, then you get down to the guts of the program. So if it is a query, so if they pass the forward slash query operator to the program, we basically search for all the devices by calling in the library and just calling get devices. It's that simple. 
and then we can loop through each of the devices and print the name of that device. So it, by having this library up here, this Belkin Wemo library, I've greatly simplified how to communicate with the devices. So now you can focus on programming the interface and the user experience and stuff like that. You don't have to really like you know mess around with uh, duplicating code all over the place for the UPnP stuff and the HTTP web request stuff. So then we come down here and we say, okay, so querying for a specific device. So if they did pass in a device name at this point, then it queries for that specific device. And it calls get device by target device name. Um, the get device function basically calls the bigger function, which gets all of the devices and then iterates them and returns only the one you're looking for. So that's all that does, just a simple little wrapper function. And then the target action, which is passed in on the command line, can either be on or off presently, because that's all I support. And based on that, I literally just call the object, which is the instance of the Wemo device through the library. And I say, I want to turn you on or I want to turn you off. And that's it. There's a lot of additional error handling that should be in here. There should be a lot of try catch blocks. There's a lot of circumstances where UPnP can throw an error. There's networking problems. I don't handle a lot of that in this application because honestly, for my applications, I don't really need it. But I didn't have a lot of time, guys, so I didnn't really want to like do the thousand line experience here and handle every single edge case. And besides, I like it when the trolls come after me a little bit. So this leaves a little meat on the bones for them. Uh, so coming down here, I just oh another function that's just kind of a lame one that I wrote is this time stamped console output. I basically wrapped console right line to print out the date and time. And I do this in a lot of my tools and programs that I write because that way when I flip through the logs and I usually log just by outputting STD out to log file or STD error, I can see the timestamps and I can see like relative times between actions and when things happen. It actually helps with debugging a lot. So in a nutshell, that's the application. It's not a whole lot of code in either place, but it actually is functional right now. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to switch over to one of my VMs named Pegleg. Yep. And we're going to go ahead and connect to Pegleg here, who's running Windows 7 Ultimate. And he's already set up and ready to go. We've got a console window here that hopefully you guys can see on this video. You'll probably have the full screen at the, to see it really well. Uh, but you can see, we'll just go ahead and CLS this, clear the screen, and here's the contents of the directory. So here's my library, my Belkin Wemo DLL, which I built on another machine, and my Wemo EXE, which utilizes that DLL. So, and then I created the script, which I'm going to show you right now. We'll go ahead and open that in notepad. It's cable modem tender.cmd. We can call them whatever we want. Again, up at the top, we've got my shameless plug. You, al you always got to put that in software that you write that you spread about the internet. That way people come and find you and pester you about doing shit wrong and tell you you're stupid. But um, just make sure you get that in there. Uh, so Cable Modem Tender, of course, by Jerry Barnacles. Come find my YouTube channel because ultimately that's what it's all about. And uh, we have some variables up here at the top. If you've never written a batch script, this is actually like really, really archaic. Most people write everything in uh, Windows Scripting Host or PowerShell or, you know, uh, b basically languages that have many more constructs than batch does. But for this, for this purpose, batch works perfectly for me because there's very little logic that I need to do in this, in this program. And I could have built all this into the application. But the thing is, I wanted the application to be kind of, and, I, and I'm going to say standalone again. This is incorrect use of that terminology. But I wanted it to basically be a utility. I didn't want it to be specifically targeted at just resetting a cable modem. I want the utility itself to focus on being able to control Wemo devices through individual commands from the command line. And then I wanted to, again, create another layer around that, which is the batch file, which controls it and gives me the specific functionality I want, which in this case is reset the cable modem if I lose connectivity. So... Uh, if we just run the script, I'll just show you guys really quick. If you just run it with no arguments, it pretty much just prints out to the command line my, my shameless plug. And that says you must supply a target host name and IP, IP address and switch name, or IP address and switch name. So down here you can see I always put an example. So cable modem tender, google.com would be the address that it was checking for connectivity. And if it lost connectivity, it would send the commands to Wemo modem, which would be the switch connected to your cable modem to turn it off, wait 30 seconds, turn it back on, and so forth. So coming back to the script, you can see here really quick, I have a couple labels in here, begin, basically goes through, checks the command line arguments to make sure you pass the correct ones. And then if you pass those two levels of validation, then you come in here and you say, okay, it's monitoring the cable modem, and then it starts a loop. And this is an infinite loop uh, that just continuously runs every 10 seconds or so, give or take. And uh, it comes in here and it says, basically ping the target, which is what you passed in on the command line. That'll be google.com in this demonstration. And if the error level zero, meaning success, everything else means fail, uh, zero, then the connection was dropped and it resets the cable modem and then it calls the reset function. The reset function down here, you can see then calls my Wemo exe script and passes the device with the switch name and the action off, which this will turn, turn that device off. 
And then if that's successful, it'll continue on. It'll wait 30 seconds. And it's printing this out to the command line. You guys will see this in the demonstration. And then it sends the on command to the switch after that. So using the same thing, the Wemo command, it sends device, finds the device, and sends action on. And then after that, it waits 60 seconds, and then it returns. And when it returns, it comes back up here to the loop, falls out, goes back through again right here, and then pings the device again. And if it pings and it's unable to ping, it will continuously power the modem off every, like, about two minutes. It's going to power the modem off and power it back on until the connection's reestablished. All these numbers are tweakable. Uh, I only put sleep up here for the for uh, some of the operations, but um, I got a little bit lazy. I didn't I didn't put them all over the place. But technically, your timeout here, where I have like timeout ten. I mean, let's go ahead and just change that to timeout sleep. And you know, now 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 it's configurable at the top of the script. So that's all the script does. It's a very very simple script that just wraps my executable and allows me to achieve my goal. So now I come out here to Cable Modem Tender. This is the scenario now. Is this machine when it boots up? I'm basically going to have a key in the registry that says launch the script automatically on logon. So every time the machine powers off and powers back on, the script is going to start running again. And, uh, and normally I'm going to have the script ping my gateway, which is basically the IP address or the target that's closest to me after the cable modem, uh, because that's the best target. Because, of course, in this demonstration, I'm using Google as a target. If Google goes down, my cable modem is going to get recycled, and it's going to cause a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of confusion. So in this example, I'm going to go ahead and say Google because, you know, they're fairly rock solid. They're up. I'm going to say, okay, so Google's my target. That's who I want to monitor. So, and then in the event that I can't contact Google, I want my Wemo modem to be reset. And those are the only two arguments I have to pass. And we'll go ahead and press enter here. And we can see right now pinging Google. And I go ahead and suppress all the output from the commands. So if we come over here, hopefully you guys can see this well. This is going to suck if this video turns out horrible. But you don't know unless you try. So let me... Uh, Get the size down. So if we scroll down here, you can see all these things I'm piping to null. Again, if you don't understand batch scripting, this isn't going to make a lot of sense to you. But null is basically just a void target. You just say, okay, throw all the output from this application into some giant black hole. We don't care about it. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, and that just makes for the script to have a little bit cleaner output. I could just leave it out and let everything you know, spam to the screen. But I, but I like it better when it's like this. It's pinging Google, connection's working, sleeping 10 seconds. Pinging Google, connection's working, sleeping 10 seconds. So everything here is, is, is working perfectly. So uh, now what we want to do is we want to simulate a lost connection to see how it handles this. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave this running to record and we're going to go downstairs and grab some additional video of me disconnecting the cable modem and uh, we're going to go ahead and let this take over and recycle the cable modem once I reestablish connectivity. All right, time to get into the messy, messy wiring closet again. All right, so you guys have seen this in my other videos. This is my messy wiring closet and my 14 terabyte home server back there. But here's my cable modem and this the sucker likes to lock up on me every couple of days. So what I did is I plugged it in here. You can see there's the Wemo switch. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I'm just recording this on my phone. And right now that script is still running upstairs that I showed you. It's monitoring Google. And as soon as it loses connectivity, it's going to power cycle the modem and wait for it to get another IP address. Um, and if it doesn't, it'll just continue to power cycle it. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a connection lost. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the coax on the back here. We're disconnected. So go ahead and watch the modem as it slowly loses its grip. And you can see the switch is still powered on. The blue light is the indicator. So right now the script is checking every 10 seconds and if it fails to ping Google, it's gonna issue the command to the switch to power it off. And it can take a little while because after the 10 seconds it has to issue the command. So there, it just lost connectivity. Now let's watch the switch. Come on, any day now. There it is. It's powered off. The modem now has no power. So now what it's going to do, it's going to wait for 60 seconds and then issue the command to power the modem back up. And if it doesn't detect an IP, it's going to do the same thing all over again. So at this point, if I plug it in, it's going to take too long to, to redetect, um, and it'll ultimately power cycle the modem again. So let's just go ahead and do that. Going around the back here. It's hard to hold the camera and do this stuff, guys. Oh, 
getting on there. I hate coax. I need to redesign this. There we go. Okay. And it's like I said, it's waiting 60 seconds. There it goes. Just issued the command to power it back up. Looks like we caught it just in time. So now that we're powered back up, it's got the coax reconnected, so it doesn't look like it's gonna skip it after all. We caught it just in the nick of time. So as soon as it detects an IP address, so it's got 60 seconds right now to get an IP, which is plenty for the cable modem. And then after that, it's gonna do another ping test. And if that ping test is successful, it'll stay on. There we go, you can see I'm online. Gotta do the focus thing there, there you go. So we're online, everything's working. There's my, there's my uh, wireless access point running DDWRT. And uh, just to answer the, the question I seem to be getting the most uh, on Facebook and stuff is if you power cycle the modem, don't you have to power cycle this too? The answer is no. This, this, this thing right here, as soon as it loses connectivity, it's basically going to be waiting for DHCP to lease it another IP address. So it, as, at least if you're running DDWRT, which is what I'm running on here, not the stock firmware. I don't know. The stock firmware would probably work fine too. So, as you can see, the power has not turned off again, so it has successfully connected to Google, and uh, it's super happy. So just one more time, just to demonstrate that this works, we'll, we'll go ahead and leave it on. Um, it should have power cycled by now if it didn't detect the connection, so right now the script is stuck in that infinite loop saying, can I contact Google, can I contact Google, leave the modem on. So we're good. Now, you know, there's an outage, Google goes down, and I want to recycle my modem. Just unplug the coax here, and within about 15 seconds, it should power off. We can see the switch is powered on, and now we wait. And this is a script I'm just going to leave running on one of my virtual machines all the time. Like I said, I'm going to have it just start up with the computer. And uh, that way I will never have to come into the closet and recycle this cable modem again. I'll just have to wait a minute or two when I lose connectivity for it to cycle. So I'm pretty excited about that. It's so one of the coolest things about software development is you solve a problem and then you get to use it. Okay, so watching the switch. There it goes, just powered off. And our cable modem has no power, none whatsoever. So you shake it, make sure there's no power in there. Well, that's about it, guys. Thanks for watching another one of my videos. Please like, favorite, and subscribe, and share my videos, and please comment. I love to know if you love my videos, and I love to know if you hate my videos. So please feel compelled to comment all you want. Um, also, the source code uh, that I showed in this, both the script and the csharp.net code, will be available. I will put links in the description. So go ahead and take a look at that. If they're not in there right now, just give me a little while. i got to find a place to upload the code and everything and get it shared out. But it will be in there, so check back if you don't see it. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I try to respond to most of the comments and mails that I get, although now I'm starting to get flooded with a pretty high volume of mails and comments, but I'm still trying to stay ahead of the wave. So, you know, hey, A plus for trying, maybe. <laughs> um, another good way to get a hold of me is on Facebook. I communicate a lot better on Facebook. So if you haven't come over and liked my page yet, the link is right on my channel. So come on over, join up. I'm also on Twitter, and I'm pretty active over there, too. So, uh... Hope to see you around. If you haven't seen my videos, if you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. I super appreciate it. You're the reason why I keep making these. So hope this video gave you a nerdgasm. If it didn't, it sure as hell gave me one. So have a nice day, guys. Take it easy.